Welcome. You're listening to The Best of Investing. I'm your host, Edward Brown. My two co-hosts, Mark Hunt and Nam Fon, are off today. Our phone number is 888-912-1190. Use that number to answer the trivia questions for a five-pack tanning certificate given away during this show. And that certificate is not sponsored by the radio station, but by Tan Bella Tanning Salon with two locations in San Francisco and one in Marin. Today's trivia theme is TV shows from the 1990s. We'll see how well you can remember. Boy, that was doesn't seem that long ago. All right, today's special guest is Sal Buscemi. Uh, so let me give you an introduction to Sal before he uh, comes on and says hello. Uh, let's see here. Sal is the CEO and co-founding partner of HRN LLC, a private multifamily investment office. Uh, let's see, what else, what else can we say about uh, Sal here? He started and successfully operated two distressed real estate credit platforms at age 29, the first being a distressed whole loan fund with a $2 billion Park Avenue investment manager. He's a frequent speaker and lecturer on real estate and finance at professional symposiums and has written numerous articles on the topic of real estate and private equity finance at various publications, including Investors Business Daily, Business Insider, Forbes, and a guest contributor for entrepreneur.com. Uh, he's also been a guest on television shows such as CBS New York, Good Morning La La Land, I like that one, and Ticker News. He started with his uh, his started his career at Goldman Sachs in investment banking in New York City and resides in Miami. Uh, Sal, welcome to the Best of Investing. Edward, it's a pleasure and a privilege, my friend. Thank you uh, for having me. Absolutely. No, I, lo I, lo I love your background. We'll we'll, we'll have to get into. Uh, uh, how you got to, how, to, how you got to be on like CBS uh, and Good Morning La La Land? I like that. That's a good one. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, you know raising capital. You had so you provided me some questions to uh, ask you here. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's I'll start off with number one. How do you see capital raising environment evolving after looking after a few uh, interest rate hikes? And there's been more than a few by now. I mean, at the time that we're recording this today was uh, 12 months to the date that the Fed started raising interest rates. And that's been 500 basis points. 500 basis points affects every living creature on earth. And it's affected housing, as we've seen. It's affected demand, except for certain states that have been beneficiaries of it, such as Florida, where a lot of people are selling their higher priced homes up north and buying homes relatively cheaper and, you know, at times overbidding and, and displacing some of the locals out of the market, but it's changed a lot. And people who are relying upon a mortgage or any sort of interest rate is really going to start to feel the pinch and it's going to affect the purchasing power, especially when, you know, people's um, raises haven't really kept up with inflation in, in, in more pragmatic terms. Interesting. Yeah. And it, it doesn't look like they're going to stop. I mean, it, uh, you get this whole uh, Silicon Valley bank uh, and signature bank issue, and I don't know. I mean, they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. If they raise interest rates, it's one thing. If they don't, then, you know, what happens then? So can you give us a little bit of prognosis on that? Uh, here's what I think. Um, unlike the two before him, Jay Powell is a deal maker. He started the Carlisle Group and he knows financial markets. He's not so much of an academic such as, um, you know, Treasury Secretary, you know, Bernanke and then later Yellen were. So, you know, he's more of a deal maker and he, he understands what's going on in the economy probably more than most people in yeah. his position. He doesn't have an enviable job. I think the Fed is <laughs> a, a political animal. You know, I think, you know, he's, you know, he's a target. He's doing a damn good job, I think. However, I do think that this Silicon Valley bank debacle and what's happening um, in Switzerland too with Credit Suisse yeah. um, is 500 basis points is going to shock the world. Um, you know, I love distressed real estate. We're starting to see that right now coming, you know, yeah. into the fold because a lot of people overpaid, especially buried, low barrier to entry at the classes like, you know, multifamily, class C multifamily, people overpaid for that. It's a, you know, it's an entry way into commercial for a lot of investors and that's where you get a lot of novices. But I think that they, my, my gut is, is that he will probably pause, but continue to raise and he will continue to pause until um, they sort of figure out what's going on globally. And if there's anything more today, you know, I, I follow, you know, I'm, I'm a financial nerd at heart. And 
you know, first, I think it was First Republic Bank today got, yeah. you know, a bunch of uninsured deposits from other banks. What does that really mean? And what does that tell you? It means that there's probably ramifications that are far reaching um, that we don't know yet. And we're not going to know yet. Yeah, that's, uh, I was just noticing First Republic Bank, which is a fine bank here in the oh, sure. area. Very fine. Big bank. bank over in your area. Yeah, yeah. Banks, and, yeah. Uh, but it's funny, their stock went from 140 just in January to that to down to like 30 now. And they dropped down yeah. to, to 20. Anyway, we're going to go to our first commercial break here. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, our first trivia question, which is uh, that we're talking the uh, TV shows from the 1990s. And again, uh, Sal, if you know the answer, don't say anything until we get back. All right. Which series... Uh, about a group of lifeguards patrolling the beaches of Los Angeles County, California, starred David Hasselhoff and Michael Newman. All right, uh, call 888-912-1190. The first caller with the correct answer wins that tanning certificate. Um, and by the way, we wanna make a mention here for Mountain Mike's Pizza in San Rafael, pizza the way it ought to be. Also the Mountain View Hotel and Spa in Calistoga, uh, offering 25% off this season. Uh, so for Mountain Mike's Pizza, go to Mountain Mike's Pizza slash San Rafael. And for the Mount View Hotel and Spa, just go to Mount View Hotel and you'll find them. And they're in Calistoga. Awesome hotel. But one of the best pools I ever swam in. All right, stay with us. The best of investing will be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, along with my special guest, Sal Buscemi. Um, so Sal, I, I want to see if you know the answer to this question. Um, which series, TV series in the 1990s about a group of lifeguards patrolling the beaches of Los Angeles County, California, starred David, David Hasselhoff and Michael Newman? What was the name of that series? Edward, that would have to be Baywatch. It would have to be Baywatch. All right, you're one for one so far. So, excuse me, we were talking about uh, Silicon Valley Bank and also um, Signature Bank. And it seems like one of the things that they got into trouble with was buying long-term low-interest bonds which in theory, if they bought, let's say 30 year bonds at 2%, if they were able to hold on to the bonds the entire time, and, you know, not such a big deal because they wouldn't be forced to sell. But if I understand it correctly, when depositors do a run on the bank and they have to provide the financing, then they have to start potentially selling assets. And that's where they started selling these at a loss. Correct, that, yes. That sound, sound that right? Correct. Yeah. Well, it's also, there was a, what we call a durational mismatch between what the income was was on those bonds versus what they were paying their depositors. So they were there was yeah. a run on the bank because they weren't able to cover that. If, you know they were. Well, that, that, know, makes, it, that makes sense. Yeah. And when you go, you know, all in on government bonds, which they should have done, and you know the Fed actually told them to do that as a result yeah. of the latest crisis. They, you know, it should not have gotten to the point where nobody really had their hand on the tiller to see, hey, you know, we're paying out more in depositors' interest than we are um, collecting in government-backed AAA security interest. Yeah. So the coupons weren't matching, and it's business 101. Yeah. You want your, you know, your income to ex exceed your expenses, and that was not what happened, and that's what caused a lot of problems at that well, point. I think about it. If you roll this thing back, if the Fed, if, if the federal government didn't overspend and pimp, print trillions of dollars of money and go into big deficits, we wouldn't have the inflation. We didn't have the inflation like we had in the prior administration at roughly you know two percent. Yeah. Then you wouldn't have interest rates rising the way they did. You wouldn't have that mismatch. Right. And interestingly enough, I'm not you know a big fan of the uh, current federal uh, government. However. And I know a lot of people are very um, jaded on uh, the president saying that he was going to cover, you know, he, he wants all depositors to be covered, even past the 250 uh, mark. And I know a lot of people, oh, that's just, you know, saving the big, big corporations. But the, the, my gut feeling tells me that that's actually probably a good decision because, A, you won't have a, a run on the bank so much. It does calm people's nerves. And I, I was listening to an interview with Barney Frank of Frank Dodd, and I thought he made actually a very, very good point, which is, you know, you can't have these big companies that have millions of dollars worth of payroll have, you know, well, okay, we can't put more than 250 in one bank. So they're going to have, what, a yeah. thousand different banks at 200,000? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm kind of actually uh, uh, not disappointed, let's put it that way. Uh, 
Of yeah, course, I mean, find out that, that uh, sorry, when, of course, when you find out that Oprah Winfrey apparently has five hundred ninety million dollars in Silicon Valley Bank and she's a big donor, uh, that, that may or may not have, have uh, stressed the decision. <laughs> you, you know, it, it's interesting, but you have to also understand that Oprah Winfrey put her money in there with the confidence, knowing that it was a strong bank. Right? It was only the sixteenth sure. largest bank. However. Those banks serve a community of entrepreneurs, and there has to be yeah. trust there at the highest risk levels, of course, too. But you got to yeah. think about it. They were taking in many more deposits than they were able to lend out, right? I mean, that, you know, that, that whole relationship banking model, was, you know, which is really making loans, they weren't able to lend anything out as fast as it was coming in because, you know, all the money from raised from VCs and everything was sitting in Silicon yeah, Valley but, Bank. But, yeah, but can't they, it doesn't, doesn't the bank just basically put it back to the Fed and... and yeah, they buy the treasuries. Yeah, yeah, they buy treasuries. Yeah. Yeah. And as long, I mean, if, if, if they were... If they like, buy long dated treasuries less than 1%, less than 2%. That's what they, and that's the, the pickle that they got in. Gotcha. Okay. Because if they would have bought even short term ones, they might not have been able to... At least right. Again, it goes back to who, you know, who is the grown up in the room and where, yeah. you know, why was this happening in the first place? Gotcha. And it probably would have helped if they didn't have a bunch of diversity equity type issues rather than just kind of let's focus on business. What's best for the bank and the depositors, you know, the way the it used to be right at Bailey savings Maybe's, and loan. Yes. I get it. Mm -hmm. exactly. I understand. Okay. Well, let, let, let's move on to, to you. All right. So uh, you started your career at Goldman Sachs. Very, very big company there. And um, what is, what's the best real estate uh, asset class right now? Oh, 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 we're, go we're going deep, aren't we? We're, we're going, going deep, the, yeah, you betcha. The, the pivoted questions. Um, it depends, you know, and I, it, you know, this is an interesting question because the people who um, invest with us, they like a certain asset class because they're not looking to get rich. They're looking to park money, you know, mm -hmm. and a great example of this is the founder of Zara. He has a family office that buys $2 billion a year in cash and real estate in London, New York, and all these class mm -hmm. A, you know, these, these tier one cities internationally. Okay. Um, but when you look at it, and if you're looking for the, you know, all things equal is who do you want paying your rent, right? And mm -hmm. the way I explain this is some guy is going to offer you an apartment building, class C, that you can invest into. Maybe you make 12%. That's great. However... The risk there is that your tenant might not have a job tomorrow. Whereas if you're going to make a seven or, you know, a seven and a half stay in like one of our industrial deals, it's a little safer because you know that, for example, Milwaukee Tool or Carrier Air Conditioning is an essential service and they're going to be around for a while because humans need to be cool. Even robots need to be cool. So, you know, it's a, you know, it becomes a, you know, it, it becomes like a, you know, do you want, and I'll ask you, Edward, I mean, yeah. Do you want someone poorer than you making rent supporting your lifestyle? You know, only if uh, my attitude is uh, I want to foreclose because, uh, well, actually, I'm a lender. Why do you need that I'm, headache? I'm a lender. I'm a lender. So I, yeah, I'm but why lender. do you need that headache, right? Yeah. No, I mean, that's I, true. It, yeah. Generally speaking, I, I like uh, nice conservative stuff. Tell you what, we're going to cut to our second commercial break. Uh, we're going to continue on with this conversation here. Second trivia question on uh, 1990s television show. What sitcom tells the story of a dim-witted former high school football player turned women's shoe salesman? Remember that one? Okay. Call 888-912-1190. First caller with correct answer wins a tanning certificate. Stay with us. The Best of Investing. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. One more time. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with my special guest, Sal Buscemi. And our second trivia question, which sitcom, uh, this is from the 19, actually, it's, I think it's from the late 80s, early 90s. Which sitcom tells the story of a dim-witted former high school football player turned woman's shoe salesman? What's the name of that one? I would say Married with Children. Married with Children. Very good. All right. Two for two. I like it so far. Um, you know, it's interesting. You're talking about asset classes. And I guess, yeah, if I'm an owner, um, yeah, I'd, I'd want to have a little bit more security. You're right. I, I'm so willing to what, give up a higher yeah. interest rate. Yeah. Go so ahead. what we like right now is uh, industrial. You know, and mm -hmm. industrial, you know, everybody, you know, if you think about it during the pandemic, e-commerce exploded. There's yeah. a lot of repatriation of manufacturing and, and storage of everything from chips to pills to, you know, pharmaceuticals. Now, so, do, you like light, do you like light industrial or more heavy? 
Well, I mean, a combination of both. It depends, okay. right? So it, it really depends on the location of it. And, and you know, some of the light industrial is what we call the last mile, you know, so that's very, very handy. And, you know, that's not anything that's going anywhere. And then you have the heavy industrial too. Um, mm -hmm. but, but these are mostly like industrial stores, you know, industrial facilities, not okay. manufacturing companies. I just want to make gotcha, sure, yeah. you know, that we've got that. So, you well, know, if you're driving good? down the highway, you see yeah. these Amazon trucks with 20 yes. days, you know, that's what we do. Okay. I was going to say, that's what I was thinking about was, you mm -hmm. know, Amazon building a, you know, 500,000 square foot space and, uh, yeah, uh, but you need a little bit of money to uh, to, to to do that. How, how much do you guys have under management? Um, right now in the real estate portfolio, we're kind of light because we um, thankfully didn't take too much action. So it's less than a hundred million right now in total okay. in equity. So um, the way you know we're very very specialized because we're very very protective of our track record, and you know the way we've done this is just working alongside and investing in world-class sponsors that put a lot of money into these deals too. Um, these aren't people who are like syndicating bucks from people they don't know, for friends and family. These are people who are putting in half the equity and we match it. And so, you know, we're very careful and guarded because our families have a certain profile and we match it that way, but we don't want to overextend ourselves. And we didn't, and we're doing very, very well, even in our, you know, even in our venture portfolios for that reason, we're just Cynical at best, paranoid at worst, Edward. Yeah, I like that. So, are you are, are you representing family offices? Is that no? We we run the family. It's structured as a family right. office. So yes, and gotcha. it, we. Um, I also have a smaller balance venture fund that I manage, but it's it's really earlier stage and it's performing quite well. Um, but we have a structure where we use it, where it's a um, you know it's a legal structure where um, you know it's we call it the master series LLC and we just use that so that the families have discretion to invest into the assets that they want to having run a fund having run a fund I can tell you it's not fun because the moment you take someone's money you have the IRR clock you know to your head the internal yes. rate of return so what happens is as soon as I get your money Edward you're going to be calling me a week later did you do it did you deploy yeah, it I, I, oh I know listen yeah. I, I do manage a fund okay uh, yeah and I can tell you it's not fun unless you get it out as quick as it comes in and not a lot of people yeah. can do that well um, actually I've, I've actually had uh, now not today but about a year ago I had more people wanting to come into the fund and mm -hmm. I had I had to say don't uh, no <laughs> I yeah, said I, yeah, I don't yeah. want your money because no. you, I, you're going to be expecting to get a return right away, and I'm not going to be able to do well, that for another three months. Well, here's the some reason why we don't do it in real estate is because, um, you know, we we don't want to be forced to do anything that we know. we You know, it forces you to make a decision you don't want to do because you have the influence and pressure. If yeah. you're not used to it, if you're an emerging manager just starting out, um, it could be really relentless pressure. And I can tell you I had that pressure with my first, you know, institutional fund. Uh, with the Park Avenue investment manager, who is my, you know, lead G lead LP and GP. So it's a it's a lot. A lot of people come and they say, "Hey, I want to start a fund." I'm like, "Well, easy. Let's talk about this because yeah. you know, if you start a fund, and you have a, you know, you're in a real estate deal or something. You have to remember everything's crossed, and in real estate, you have the cross promotes. So if you you know if you have a you hit a double over here, but you strike out over here, you know, you're you know you're not really going anywhere, and True. You know, it doesn't, it, it, it causes too much, I think, confusion. So that's why we use a STV structure. Yeah, what, what do you, generally, what is your target rate of return? Do you try to uh, aim for? Let's put it uh, I don't like to talk about that. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's something that I don't, I, it, to me, it's unachievable. You know, I, I don't want to be, you know, there's always something that we'll put together. And, you know, when we're talking to these families and we say, hey, this is the, what we're underwriting, you know, between, you know, I, you know, a dollar, dollar twenty-five square foot, or something, or some yeah. sort of return. You know, or an exit cap rate, or you know, of like a, um, you know, an, you know, seven and a half, or something like that. We'll put a range on it with an error towards the lower part. What yeah. we want to do is what we sell is really the, the, the prestige of the investment, right? Who you're yeah. investing alongside of? Who's the sponsor? They, they've been through three. You know, they've been through two cycles already. 2008 was one, right? I want someone, you know, going back to the late 90s when I was around. Um, the other thing is I want a strong sponsored co-investment. At least, you know, 5% is cute, 10% is thoughtful. You know, anything more shows conviction. Yeah. And then the last I want an audit the track record. And then when you tell a story about, you know, this is a you know, development arm of, you know, this retailing family and, you know, they do a really good job building this stuff. People want to be involved in that. So it's really the quality of the asset that we sell that people want to get involved with because the reason why people don't get into these things is because they didn't have a career um, starting at Wall Street, you know, doing things like this. So they don't have the network. And that's the problem is that their deal flow is representative of the network that they have or don't have.
Gotcha. Okay. We're going to cut to another break here pretty soon. And uh, yeah, it's interesting because at Pacific Private Money, we we did eh, it's just, just short of a billion dollars last year. And mm -hmm. uh, primarily, we're, you know, we're, all we are is debt funds. And so uh, the interesting thing is we have this one fund called the Freedom Fund where it's liquid. Oh. You just have to get us 30 days notice. And right now we're paying either 7 8 or 9%, depending upon if you put in 250, 500 or a million. And for oh people who pay like 5 million, we're paying them 10%. And you yeah, get your yeah. money out. So yeah, it's a yeah. good parking place for people. All right. Here's our uh, third trivia question. This uh, goes pretty fast. All right. Which uh, series, talking a TV series from the 19, uh, this is actually right. This TV series ran from 1987 to 1995, starring Bob Saget, David Collier, and John Stamos, or Stamos, uh, which tells the story of three men raising three young children. All right. What was the name of that TV series? Call 888-912-1190. First caller with the correct answer wins that tanning certificate. All right. Also, I'll make a very quick mention here. Petty Theft, which is a tribute band to uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, is playing at uh, in Petaluma at the Mystic Theater on April 8th. Check them out. Petty Theft. All right. Stay with us. The Best of Investing. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Best of Investing. One more time. Edward Brown here along with Sal Buscemi, our, my special guest. All right, uh, the third trivia question here was, uh, which TV series ran from 1987 to 1995, starring Bob Saget, Dave Collier, and John Stamos, which tells the story of three men raising three young children? What was the name of that TV series? Would it be Full House, Edward? It would be Full House. Holy oh, smokes, wonderful. about a thousand for today. Good job, Sal. <laughs> All right, um, and last, last mention here, uh, the Tahoe Lakeshore Lodge uh, it's an all lakefront hotel. Every lodge room and condominium has a view of the lake. You got to check them out at Tahoe Lakeshore Lodge. All right. Um, so Sal, uh, why do people fail in business of raising capital? Um, raising capital is a lot like dating. <laughs> and um, it's, you have to go through the motions before you get to where you want to go. And I think what happens is, is that because of crypto or society and social media, it's forced people to treat wealthy people like ATMs. And it's a very, they turn it into something that's very transactional when it's 100% relational. Mm -hmm. And being new to Miami and just getting invited to the Florida venture scene, I can tell you there's no bedside manners here. It's, you get French fries. What happens when you throw a French fry on the beach? all the seagulls come, right? So, <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is what happens. You got the red dart on your tag and it says, you know, allocator or investor, and then, you know, people are coming to you. It's interesting too, because, um, you know, during uh, the beginning of the year in January, JP Morgan healthcare conference uh, occurs in San Francisco. And there are people who actually will drive founders from LA, Oregon, Washington, Seattle to drive Ubers during that week to meet with investors. And then in the lift ride home, you get pitched. Well, that's funny. That's oh, very, yes. That's very interesting. You know, it's oh, funny. Yeah. My, uh, uh, Mark Hunt, the president of Pacific Private Money, and I, uh, about, oh, gosh, this is going back about six years or so, uh, we were invited uh, to speak uh, at Martha's Vineyard. Uh, oh, nice. Hoity -toity type thing. You know, they call them centimillion, centimillionaires and billionaires, right? And it was funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. The family offices and stuff. And, and it was funny because this one guy, you know, you had a cocktail party and he's just dressed kind of, you know, normal. And I just made a comment, uh, you know, hi, but my name's Edward. And uh, he introduced himself as, as, oh, yeah, no, I'm just the uh, the beach boy. Uh, you know, I, I get drinks for everyone. I knew he wasn't. Right. But we hit it off. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and, and yeah. we still stay in, in contact. And you know what That's the funny really thing cool. is? You know, we didn't get a single investor when we went. You know why? We were, too, we were too conservative. These guys, well, these guys wanted, you know, 12, 15, 18% return. And we said, we're not like that. I mean, our, our whole thing is we don't lose money. Well, we, some of them don't know that, right? They don't know what they don't know. And they, you know, they read risk like a wine list, which is over to the right and down, you know, and they're trying to, oh, well, I found something. And a perfect example of this is the peer to peer lending site, prosper.com. You know, if you look at that, all those higher interest loans that are like rated like, you know, double black diamond, like don't touch, like they, they get bit up the most because people look at it and they think that, hey, you know, it's 
it's a higher return. It must be a better investment. It makes you look smarter when really that's not it. Yeah. And, you know, it was interesting because if you were to ask people if they were to be offered 10% interest or 11% return interest, um, but in order to get the 11%, you had to take double the risk. No. Most people, well, most people in a poll would choose the 11 because really? they don't understand the risk. Yes, I would, I challenge you, I challenge you to put that on your LinkedIn and see what happens, really. Well, I mean, for with uh, those parameters, to me, that's ridiculous. It'd be one thing if it's like, you know, 10% versus 18%, you know, and you go 50, 50. I've written articles on this kind of stuff and, and the importance of not losing money. That's to me, that's the, the biggest thing. Oh, yeah. Preservation of principle, I've, I've made them a decent amount. I don't want to lose it. And that yeah. doesn't mean I got to stick it under a mattress, but yeah. you take reasonable, you know, calculated risks with it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, of course. I mean, it depends too. I mean, a lot of people don't understand what risk is, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. Do you, know, uh, do you want to know what the definition of risk is? Sure, go ahead. It's what your friends and family will make fun of you for if the deal goes wrong. <laughs> that's, that's good. I like that. So I, here's a funny story. I was speaking yeah. on stage in Miami about five years ago at a conference, and somebody, one of my friends was heckling me. Uh, his name is Marco. And I gave him the answer, and the audience roared because it's true, right? It, it, everybody else had this quantified answer, you know, it, you know, very, very, you know, detailed, statistical. But really, when it comes down to it, is how awkward are your Thanksgivings going to be going forward? <laughs> well, you know, you know, I, this is what I tell everyone is uh, everything's based on alternatives. I said the safest thing you can do is put the money in your hand because you know it's there. Now you risk being robbed and you don't earn interest. So then you go, okay, well, what's the very next the best thing I could do? Okay, treasury bills because it's short term, you know what I mean? And you go yeah, through yeah, the ladder, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And yeah. then, then you get yeah. into like crypto and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I try to get the, the highest returns for the least yes. amount of risk, obviously, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But what is that? So like like the thing that we've been doing, we have um, in, in our Southwest fund, the one that I manage, we buy mm -hmm. discounted notes. And yeah. we've been uh, we've been very successful, and and uh -huh. I think it's, it's I think it's only going to get better because with the economy getting a little bit wonky, the mm -hmm. prices are going to come down. There's going to be more mm -hmm. opportunity, and mm -hmm. uh, but you know we're we're not buying you know five million dollar homes uh, uh, notes on five million dollar homes. We're a little sure bit more on the lower end, and the way I look at it, everybody needs a place to live. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, no matter how no matter how bad things get, I'm not going to live in a tent. I might have mm -hmm. to downsize. I might have to live in an apartment, but I'm mm -hmm. not going to, to just be completely homeless if I can avoid it. Do you want to know how the really, really wealthy people do it? Please. It's called fine art lending. Okay. And we actually are part of that. And you basically have priceless collateral that's collateralized by a 50% LTV loan. Okay. And we work with a family out of LA um, that we feed into. And it's great because they can get out in 12 months. It's liquid. But it's also, you know, insured, probably better than most FDC <laughs> banks for FDIC yes, banks right yeah. now, right? I mean, think about it. And art only goes up in value. There's been a drop, but since it's seen as much more of a store of value today, especially since it's very, very liquid, and you can foreclose on it quickly. So it's a that's a, you know, the fine art financing has been a hobby of mine, and I've been working with someone who's um, who's very, very you know, who who operates this fund, and I can tell you, it's a it's a great business. Interesting. I like it. All right. So we don't have a trivia question, but Sal, stay with us. We'll be back yes. with some closing comments. Don't touch that dial, audience. Welcome back to the Best of Investing. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Sal Buscemi, my special guest. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned about FDIC insurance, and I actually had a banker today call me uh, trying to get me to move money from, you know, because of all the banking situations going on, uh, to the, their, into their wealth management and how mm -hmm. their, their money market accounts are paying actually fairly well. And they do it through like, you know, Fidelity and, you know, big, big companies. And she says, oh, and by the way, it's, you know, it's, it's insured by CIPIC. And I said, well, if I remember correctly, I said, CIPIC insures, like in case things get lost, I said, it's not going to guarantee like the FDIC insurance. And she said, no, 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 actually it's, it's, you know, it protects against losses. I said, I don't think so. And she said, she goes, well, let me send you the article. And she sends me the article and she highlights certain things, but then 
she didn't read like two sentences above oh. where it specifically says, you know, we don't insure against decline in market value. And if and, and you may not be old enough to remember this, but I remember when Evergreen money market account, which was at a very, very high rated money market fund, was very close to if they, uh, and they may have, I don't remember. Breaking the buck. Breaking the buck. And that's the term I use, breaking the buck. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, I mean, you, you trivia break question. Buck. Yeah. What does that have? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's, what's breaking the buck? Yeah. I mean, that, that, uh, if, in fact, I think what happened was they were about to break the buck and mm -hmm. all these other money market funds said, no, we're going to cover your losses because yeah. it's going to affect them too. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Like I mean, all this it, banking stuff. It's contagious, you know, it's contagion. However, that person's probably just trying to sell you a FIBA, you know, if it's a FIBA, oh, I know, I you know, know. It, it's, yeah. you know, every time you dance, you know, they make money. You know, every time your money <laughs> you dances, they make money. So well, it's so know, funny it's, when I went into, I mean, she's she actually, uh, she's, she's more of a high powered banker. Uh, so she knows about, you know, fidelity investments and stuff. But I actually, it's so funny when I go to the bank, just the regular bank to just deposit something or cash a check. And, uh, and sometimes you get, see, you get the I pitch. I get the pitch. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Brown, you should go see our securities guys over there, blah, blah, blah. And I go, I, I go, you, don't you know what I do for a living? You know, or yeah. I used to have my securities license all the way back to 1983. I go, I know exactly what these guys are doing. Yeah. No offense, but I go, I don't want to lose my money. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like, look, I got to go to the bathroom. We can do this another time. Yeah, exactly. Like I go, how much do you get? I mean, they make like five bucks or something every time that they throw me over to that. The, they stop doing that. I mean, I, I literally told them, don't, don't do this anymore. And I don't, I don't think they do it to anybody else. Hey, um, Sal, we forgot to give out your information. If, uh, People, I'm sure you'll be willing to add, answer questions yeah. for people if they have absolutely. Them. You can follow me on uh, LinkedIn, Salvatore Bashemi. If you want to send an email to me, um, it's sal at investinglegacy.com. Sal at investinglegacy.com. S A L, not S O L. And um, what I'll do is maybe I will give them a uh, maybe a copy of one of my guides for free. Okay. Um, something, you know, that I wrote, which is pretty punchy and, you know, okay. you know, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, maybe they get a little surprise in return. Okay. So, and yeah, it's S-A-L, which is Sal. Otherwise, yep. it would S-O-L would be Saul. Correct. Yes. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Very yep. good. Um, we've got just another minute to go. Uh, what do you want? I know we didn't get a chance to go through all of your stuff. Uh, sure. any, anything you want to leave the uh, audience with, um, you know, any comments? Um, I would say if you're going into any sort of, and I know that you're very, very conservative, but everybody here has the greed gene, right? And it's all expressed differently. And I would say, you know, just a piece of advice, if you're going to go, going to go into anything private, such as venture capital or, you know, commercial real estate syndications, always understand that it's the, um, the experience of the sponsor, the operator, the founder, which is going to get you through the yeah. tough times, the people who have the experience. Very good. All right, so, so thank you for being my guest. And here's our thoughts for the day. Uh, usually I have a couple of funny ones. So I only have a serious, I have a serious one and then a funny one. All right, okay. blessed is he who has learned to admire, but not envy, to follow, but not imitate, to praise, but not flatter, and to lead, but not manipulate. I like that one. And the, you know what the best gift is? A broken drum. Nobody can beat that. All right. Tune in next week to the best of investing. We always have these dad jokes. We're going to be giving away more free prizes for answering trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown, wishing you the best of investing. So long. <laughs>